Welcome to Lex's World, everybody, and my Soil 103 episode, which is the big conclusion, I guess, to the Cannabis Soil Growing series, and we'll be talking about major theories in advanced soil growing, how to get precision analysis of your soil, and I will go over some sample recipes and my own preferred soil method. And this episode is brought to you by... TNB Naturals, right here, makers of organic growing products like this non-caustic pH up and down. And they're from Canada. Link to them down in the video description. So, if you followed along through the first two lessons, you're probably starting to notice that there's more than one school of thought when it comes to looking at soil once you go beyond the more casual buying of a premix off the shelf. Premixes like Sunshine Mix or Pro Mix are a couple of good ones you can find all over the place, and they're popular in Canada, by the way. They're both mixes based in peat, perlite, some limestone. Pretty straightforward. I like the non-organic Pro Mix as a base, personally. Anyway, there's two advanced school of thought. The first school, which I've nicknamed Live Soil Growing, is where you see soil as a living, breathing organism that needs to be nurtured, balanced with a list of ingredients and ideal ratios, remain mostly free of water mixed nutrients while watering, and eventually when the ingredients wear out, the soil's recycled back to usable condition. The other school is one I nicknamed Buffer Soil Growing, where you use some kind of basic topsoil native to your area as a blank slate into which amendments and water mixed nutrients are added. And the native topsoil is mostly just a buffer for those additions. Once the soil runs through its usefulness as a buffer, it's replaced with a new batch, while the old batch is disposed of or at best composted. The first school is more common in practice amongst outdoor soil growers, and the second school is more common in practice amongst indoor and greenhouse soil growers. Which makes sense when you think about it, because when you're gardening outside, it often makes sense that soil would take center stage for you. It may be pretty obvious to my viewers that I'm more in the second school, but I'm sort of in an oddball camp between the usual buy a premix people and the buffer soil school. What I'll do is I'll use a premix like promix and that'll be my standalone medium for young plants with a rockwool cube as a starting point for germination in the center. Then I mix in a modest amount of chicken manure and a bit of bat guano as amendments when the plants get transplanted to bigger pots. The pots are largely full of promix. And then, through flowering, I also add unsulfured molasses, just as described in my sugars episode, which if you've watched, you may recall is just a soil treatment, not anything for your plants. So yeah, I just use a premix brand that I trust with a few modifications along the way. The reason I'm more in the buffer school is only because I feel like soil balancing, cycling, and so forth is more time than I'd like to put towards my medium. Plus, I'm more of the view that complex soil recipes and treatments can lead to mistakes, accidental chemical toxicities, and so forth. Which leads me into the next point of discussion how to know what the exact state of your soil is. Really knowing your soil that well involves lab testing, which costs money and may not be worthwhile in a small personal area, unless you have a really consistent soil routine, and then one test can give you a lot of info for years down the road. There are many lab analysis tests you can run on soil. A base cation saturation ratio, BCSR test, a sufficiency level of available nutrients. You can even run texture and composition tests. The more money you're willing to spend, the more you can know. The lab just charges you a bit of info for every little piece that you're asking for. Expect to spend at least $50 US for a basic testing package though, but rarely more than $200.
Looking through these sample reports, you can see that it's easy to get the CEC value of your mix, an important figure we've discussed in Soil 102, and the PPM status of every nutrient you could possibly care about. This is an example of the results you'd see if you ordered a package from a &L Laboratories, which is a very established company. But there's many of these soil analysis lab companies. There's also useful graphical scales to indicate whether a certain nutrient level is excessive, sufficient, or low. This can be very valuable in knowing, for example, whether you need to feed nitrogen with your water or whether you don't need it at all because your particular soil mix is already crazy high on nitrogen. An enormous amount of nutrients, 80% or more of all nutrients by some estimates, are used needlessly. Sometimes it's a big money saver to know which newts you need and which ones you really don't for your soil mix. This saving of cash on nutrients by running a test makes more and more sense the bigger your grow is. Okay, now the final item I wanted to go over. Examples of super soil recipes. These are custom recipes that are more aligned with live soil growing method. A couple of things first about mixing your own super soil. You shouldn't grow seedlings in it. You should only transplant more mature plants into it. Because most super soil recipes are too intense for seedlings or clones. They'll give them nutrient burn. And second, bear in mind that if you want to use your super soil immediately, it's a good idea to wash it out in some water and then let it dry off first. If you have time before using it, which is how it should be, let it sit for at least four to six weeks in a big container and mix it and dampen it occasionally so that it can cook, blend, and lose its edge, so to speak. As for the amounts you want to make, well, if you're flowering in a seven gallon pot, that means you have just under one cubic foot per plant. The first super soil here is an organic mix by Tom Hill from California. It will make 50 cubic feet, or well over 300 gallons of soil mix, so adjust the amounts as needed. I think it's good to make a mix one time for over a year ahead though. Here's another recipe that's a variation of a common combination. I even have a nice graphic for it. It's four parts basic soil blend, so not potting soil, just a native topsoil blend. One part worm castings, one part cocoa, one part either perlite or vermiculite, and then a little bit of guano and a little bit of bone or blood meal. That's a powerful recipe, by the way, that for sure requires the four to six weeks of soil container prep time. But if you modify it slightly to this recipe right here, that's one that you can easily use after a relatively fast 48 hours of soaking if you rinse the mix out with water well and then the water can run off somewhere. Now here's a much more basic recipe that involves compost, because I know a lot of you like composting. Two parts cheap potting soil of your choice, one part organic compost, worm castings and manures make the best composts in my opinion by the way, and one part perlite. That's a pretty low intensity super soil that doesn't require much container cook time. And now let's finish off with a much more complex one that makes over a hundred gallons and I added a little explanation on what each weird ingredient primarily does. I won't read it all out loud but feel free to pause the video. So there you go, and that was only five recipes, so there's really no end to these combinations and you can create your own, but to create your own recipes and to not burn your plants, you have to learn quite a bit. For example, you have to know which ingredients you gotta be really careful with and can only ever mix in in really low amounts, like Epsom salt. But it goes without saying that live soil growers, buffer soil growers, and even plain old premix people can achieve terrific results. The hardcore members of each group will argue passionately about why their method is the best in the growing world. My response to all of them is, 
Taste and smell of cannabis are really subjective, but the yield is easy to measure and compare. And the one amongst you who does a good job in soil and in lighting, that's the person who's the best. Because triple digit percentage gains in yield are dictated by small decisions that you make in your lighting. Well, that's it for Soil 103, everybody. Please subscribe if this was useful. Hit that like button as well. And all relevant links I could think of for this episode are in the video description as always. And we'll see you all next time.